Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Paul Rozier. I am the director of the Albert LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and a member of the Villanova History Department faculty. Welcome to this special event in the center's year-long series, Cities and Historical Perspectives. A special welcome to our distinguished guests, Inga Safran and Bob Weinberg, who will talk about the history of the Ukrainian port city, Odessa. Before we begin, I first want to acknowledge the vision and support of Albert LePage, whose generosity allowed us to establish the LePage Center in 2017. And I want to thank Kevin Fox and Alvin Wong for helping to organize tonight's event. Finally, I want to encourage you to attend the LePage Center's next two events. On Wednesday, November 8th at 6 p.m., the LePage Center is collaborating with the English Department and Global Interdisciplinary Studies to consider what speculative fiction can tell us about real world history. The event begins at 6 p.m. and takes place in Driscoll Auditorium, Driscoll Hall. No registration is required. And on Thursday, November 16th, we will offer another session on cities and historical perspective, this one focusing on the theme of public health in cities. This virtual event begins at 6 p.m. and does require advanced registration. To register, please visit the LePage Center homepage. Tonight, we are focusing on the Ukrainian port city of Odessa, which has been in the news the past year or so. In January, the United, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, added Odessa to its list of endangered world heritage sites because of its contributions to literature, cinema, and the arts in general. And this past July, the Russian military attacked the Ukrainian grain export infrastructure in Odessa, which increased food costs for millions of people. I turn to Bob Weinberg and Inga Safran for historical perspective on Odessa's place in Ukrainian and European history. You can pose questions to them at any point via the Q&A function. First, brief introductions. Bob Weinberg is the Isaac H. Clothier Professor of History and International Relations at Swarthmore College, where he has taught for over 30 years. He is the author of several books about revolutionary movements, anti-Semitism and the Jewish question in Tsarist Russia and the Soviet Union. He's also written extensively about anti-Jewish pogroms in Odessa in the early 20th century. His books include The Revolution of 1905 in Odessa, Revolutionary Russia, A History and Documents, Blood Libel and Late Imperial Russia, The Trial of Mendel Bayliss, Ritual Murder in Russia, Eastern Europe and Beyond, and the forthcoming book, Jews Under Tsars and Communists, The Four Questions. Welcome, Bob. Thank you. Inga Safran is the architecture critic for the Philadelphia Inquirer. For more than 20 years, she has been a forceful advocate for meaningful design, accessible public spaces and transit, affordable housing, historic preservation, and policies that make our cities more livable and climate resilient. Her work has been recognized with the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for Criticism, the 2018 Vincent Scully Prize from the National Building Museum, a 2012 Loeb Fellowship from Harvard's Graduate School of Design, and a 2023 Guggenheim Fellowship. She previously served as a foreign correspondent, a correspondent in Eastern Europe, and the former Soviet Union. In the 1990s, she covered wars in Yugoslavia and Russia, where she witnessed the destruction of Sarajevo and Grozny. She has published two books, Becoming Philadelphia, How an Old American City Made Itself New Again, and Caviar, The Strange History and Uncertain Future of the World's Most Coveted Delicacy. She's also currently working on a social and architectural history of the American newspaper building, tentatively titled, Hold the Presses, how Newspaper Buildings Shaped the American City. And I'll note that Inga has served on the LePage Center Advisory Council since its founding in 2017. Welcome, Inga, and thank you both for joining us this evening. My pleasure. Thank you, Paul. Um, I hope it's not too confusing. I'm just going to um, deal with the um, Eastern European and, and Russian part of my past uh, tonight. Um, well, it's nice to be here with you, Bob. Um, talking about Odessa. Um, there are certain cities that exist in our imaginations as much as they, they do in real life. And I think Odessa is one of those places. Uh, and because so much of what we know about Odessa is filtered through literature 
and film. It's easy to think of the city fixed in the past, in the crowded alleys and nightclubs of Isaac Babel's early 20th century short stories, or amid the monumental architecture of Sergei Eisenstein's Soviet era film, um, Battleship Potemkin. But now Putin's assault on Ukraine has forced us to see Odessa as, you know, in a more modern context, I think, as, as a 21st century uh, war zone, uh, a besieged port, a crucial storehouse for the world's food supply. And I was thinking that Odessa is really the perfect retort to Putin's throwback views of ethnic identity and warfare. Well, Putin keeps insisting there's no independent Ukrainian identity, that the nation of Ukraine is merely a chunk of Russia that went astray. Odessa has long understood what it means to have overlapping identities. Odessa has always been on the edge of some empire, absorbing something from all of them. And the mix of influences is what makes it the essence of a modern city. Uh, there may be no better place in the Ukraine for understanding the causes and complexities of the current war. To give you a sense of the city's multi-ethnic character, I thought I'd read a passage from B Babel's essay, The Aroma of Odessa, which was written during or, or just after the First World War. Ruined people have flocked to our town, Babel wrote. Strange Jews who are foreign to us, refugees from Latvia and Poland. Serbs and Romanians have come, but nobody who loves Odessa can say a word against these Romanians. They brought life back to Odessa. They remind us of the days when the streets were full of trade, when we had Greeks trading coffee and spices, German sausage makers, French book peddlers, Englishmen in the steamship offices. The Romanians have opened restaurants, play music with cymbals, fill taverns with their fast foreign speech. They have sent us handsome officers with yellow boots and tall, elegant women with red lips. These people fit the style of our town. So Bob, let's, let's begin at the beginning. Um, the ancient Greeks, Turks, Tatars, Romanians, they all had trading posts on the site of modern Odessa, which was sits on the upper shore of the Black Sea, sort of due north of Istanbul. Uh, yet there was no real city there till, till 1792. Uh, what's the story behind that? It was part of the Ottoman Empire, as, and it was a, since Middle Ages, a fishing village. Uh, there was a fortress nearby, and it's not until Catherine the Great uh, was able to force the Ottoman Empire to cede this part of the northern Black Sea coast to the Russian Empire. And she decided that it would be a perfect place to build a city. And they devoted enormous resources to, re to constructing a new city uh, that became Odessa. And so it's a city that starts with very few people in the 1790s, and by World War I, there's over 600,000, which made it the fourth largest city in the Russian Empire after Petersburg, Moscow, and Warsaw. Uh, and its growth is meteoric, and it really becomes a center of, of a new way of, I would say, maybe a new way of life in the Russian Empire, given its its willingness and ability to attract people from all over the world and within from within the Russian Empire uh, who wanted new starts and new opportunities. Uh, and it, it and because of the state's policies, it encouraged people to move there. Certainly Russians, ethnic Russians and Jews in particular were allowed to leave the Pale of Settlement. Uh, and moved to Odessa without any problem. Jews from other part, countries in Eastern Europe were given the opportunity to come, and uh, including peasants, serfs, if they were able to get to Odessa, and they would sort of 
be able to maintain their freedom from the surf owners. So it was a point of destination and a point of opportunity. I, I just wanted to read to sort of give it, people an idea of its reputation. You have, you have a quote too, right? Yeah, uh, this is from the autobiography of Sholem Alechem, who is this fabulous writer in Yiddish of short stories. And he records, and he's saying he recorded a childhood conversation in which a friend boasting of his family's impending move from the shtetl, so Odessa tells him, and now I'm quoting, you'd wish you and I both had the gold that rolls around there during the course of a day. When Alechem asked the friend what his father will do there, the friend responds, my father will have granaries full of wheat. My father will have an office with clerks. And money, money will flow into our pockets by the sackful. Odessa, are you kidding? Uh, it's seen as a El Dorado, where the streets are going to be paved with gold. And that was a far cry from what it really was like. But certainly people who wanted to make a living in commerce, especially the trade in wheat, uh, some of them became very wealthy. Yeah. Apparently, the Afrusi family, which was the second richest family uh, after the Rothschilds uh, in Europe, mm -hmm. originally started out as grain merchants uh, and then ended up as, as bankers uh, in Vienna. But um, before we talk about some of that, um, I just want to go, uh, go back and, and, and ask you, why, why was Catherine so keen on that particular location? Were, were her motives particular? primarily military? Was she seeking a warm water port that could be used as a base for defending Russia against the Ottomans? Or were her, her motives more mercantile? Did she see Odessa as a commercial hub for trading with Southern Europe? Um, I think what, all of that. I mean, that, that, that decision in that particular. Yeah, I mean, was the port particularly, was the harbor particularly good? Yeah, I mean, they, were, she, they have to build the harbor, but it's deep, so they were able to, it would ha be able to handle large ships. I mean, I think just as Peter the Great created St. Petersburg as a window to the West, uh, Catherine is thinking about expanding the empire that's going, you know, south and southeast constantly since the 17th and 18th centuries. And Odessa is a perfect place for it to establish its presence. And it gives it, Russia access to the Mediterranean. Once they get through the Black, from the Black Sea through the Bosporus, they have access to all the ports and countries in Southern Europe and North Africa as well, and then out to the Atlantic and to you know northern Northern Europe. Uh, and so they, in a sense, you can. I never thought of it in those terms. They sort of can encircle Europe from the north and from the south with its ships and uh she makes the city a uh, not she but one of the first governors of the city uh makes it a free port free port meaning that there's no customs on imports or exports and that really helped uh encourage people to set up sh businesses there mm. uh, sounds a lot like trieste the role that trieste played mm -hmm. for the habsburgs yeah 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 and it's and it becomes a major, uh, it becomes by the end of the 19th century, certainly the largest uh, port in terms of the export of grain in the Russian Empire. Petersburg handles in volume more, more traffic overall, but Odessa is the major, uh, air, major port for all the grain that's being produced in Ukraine. And once they are able to create a railway system that will enable the transport of grain more easily and quicker to Odessa from the interior, uh, Odessa just uh, becomes a juggernaut of economic development. And along with all the other industries that go with it, there's a lot of uh, food processing as well. Sugar beets, which you probably never think about, that can be refined into raw sugar. Uh, that, 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 Sugar beets are grown in Ukraine, so people will set up shop. Uh, the Brodsky family is what it's well known. Uh, will take advantage of it, the uh, ability to import 
or transport sugar beets to Odessa and then process them for use around the world and also within Russia itself. I was struck by your description of how this was the place where all the go-getters went in Russia, because Russia was never sort of a go-getter entrepreneurial society. Um, and in looking at the, the demographic history of Odessa, it was interesting to see that Russians were initially the dominant group. Um, by the late 19th century, however, Jews accounted for 40% of the population. Um, there weren't that many Ukrainian initially. Can you can you talk about you know why there why why were there so many Jews there, um, okay. and why were there so few Ukrainians initially? Okay, so Catherine didn't the, the policy didn't, policies didn't encourage settling Ukrainians, and I'm not sure why. Uh, maybe they wanted to keep the Ukrainians down on the farm to. Uh, uh, so they would keep producing the wheat and uh, other uh, products. And Jews came because it was a way to escape the poverty of the Pale of Settlement. Uh, and there was, and for those who are thinking in terms of new opportunities, the lack of an established Jewish community with its institutions and traditions, it's sort of is a breath of fresh air for many Jews who want to escape that kind of control and con constraint on their lives. And so Odessa is perfect for Jews who want to become more modern, more secular, uh, which is going to be harder to do in the regions of the Pale of Settlement. And so it attracts, it becomes a center of literary and cultural experimentation. And lots of writers flock to the area because of its reputation as an area where you're going to meet like-minded people and uh, you're going to be able to be culturally creative without anybody, in a sense, breathing down on your neck and the government's going to leave you alone because you're allowed to live there. So you don't have to worry about not having any visa, any papers that would allow you to legally reside there so they don't have to hide. You didn't, Jews didn't have the same opportunity to say, go to Moscow. Or, or, or St. Petersburg. Well, Moscow was close to them. They would the only. I mean, they could go illegally, and many do. Or if they were, if they possessed enough money, and were you know, they registered as a certain level in the, as a merchant, they were allowed to live in Moscow or St. Petersburg. But in those cities, every so often, this towards the end of the nineteenth century. Uh, the government would decide to expel as many of the Jews who were living there illegally, but that doesn't happen in Odessa. Uh, you know, Odessa is a city that's constantly growing. I'm, I apologize, I'm looking at some notes. Uh, less than 50% of the people living in Odessa around 1900 had been born. So people were, you know, first generation, second generation, and there's a constant flow of people in the city, you know, in uh, is growing exponentially, but along with it comes all the pro problems of modern life and urbanization. Uh, so people look for opportunity, but they often find poverty because uh, they, you know, they have to compete with others looking for work as well. Uh, yeah, not. All, I mean, there are a lot of Jewish success stories, but um, if yeah, you read Babel, there was there was also this uh, large Jewish underclass. Yeah, as as well, there are a lot of poor people. Um, how, how much? Uh, so there were quite a few wealthy Jews and a lot of cultured Jews, a lot of actors and musicians, as well as writers. How, how much political and economic power did they actually wield? Well, there's the image that the Jews controlled the city, uh, and a lot of the wealth, certainly in the export and the grain trade and so on is is in the hands of Jews. Uh, but that doesn't get translated into political power because uh, the political power is going to reside with the Russians who control uh, municipal government and, and Tsarist officials. So the Jews are never able to translate that economic power into any real political clout because they're just not allowed to. 
Uh, I think their representation on the city council will be limited, restricted. Uh, and the it's curious, so even though Odessa is seen as a very free liberal city, the mayors, if, and they're not really called mayors at the time, but let's refer to them as mayors, certainly after 1905, are arch reactionaries who are not very fond of Jews and are blaming Jews for all the ills besetting Russia at the time. Uh, so they're going to limit the if any real power that the Jews could exercise in the political arena. Uh, and, you know, so Jews are limited to the economic realm. Uh, and uh, maybe within the Jewish community itself, wealthy Jews are the leaders of the community. But uh, that doesn't get translated into the city, a real power in the administration of the city. And in fact, there were a series of really terrible po pogroms, right? And, mm -hmm. and Babel, again, describes them in, in, in really vivid detail. Um, mm -hmm. Were those uh, spontaneous, would you say, or were they orchestrated? Okay, so <laughs> the received wisdom until about, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, when I started writing about it and others, is that the gov Tsarist government organized these pogroms. As best I can tell, the Tsarist government was not interested in fomenting social unrest because they can't control it. And it would be a foolish municipal governor to do the same. It's just sort of a bad career move if you spark unrest for several days. Uh, you may, that's not saying they don't sympathize with the pogroms that attack Jews and persons and their property, but it's, there's no evidence as far as I'm aware of that shows that they orchestrated this. Uh, so they tended to be, usually there's a spark in all these pogroms that sort of ignite the trouble. And given the right circumstances, uh, the, the issue will explode into a pogrom. Uh, and then there's some, certainly the worst of pogrom is in 1905, and there's certainly some organization. And that would be a, a, after the, the loss of, of, of the war with Japan. Yes, with Japan. And the issue, in, uh, sorry, Nicholas II issued this manifesto granting civil rights and promising to establish a parliamentary assembly, uh, sort of, you know, because of this revolutionary uh, revolution that occurred throughout 1905. And this was his way of def trying to defuse the situation. So there were people on the extreme right who were interested in punishing the Jews because they were seen as the fault, the blame was placed on the Jews for forcing Nicholas to make these concessions because Jews are revolutionaries and uh, they need to be punished. But on the other hand, that is, but they don't start it. It's a more spontaneous kind of event where people celebrating the concession of what is known as the October Manifesto and those protesting are in the streets and they meet on the streets and trouble breaks out. Uh, exactly why. And then the police and the military really look the other way at times. So it takes them a few days. Once they decide to restore order, they do, but it takes them a few days to make that decision. And it's also not clear to me whether they could have actually, whether the police were able to actually control the mobs because they were also understaffed, undertrained, under-resourced, and so on. And in a lot, many sense, you know, sympathetic to what the pogromists were doing towards the Jews. Mm -hmm. was 1905 was a, a, a big year for immigration of, yeah. from, from all of Russia. And I understand that um, because of those pogroms in Odessa, a lot of Odessan Jews left for Palestine Yeah, at that yeah. time. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of the numbers? Um, no, that I don't know. But mm -hmm. it's certainly true, Jews after 1905, certainly in the aftermath of the pogrom, but there are pogroms throughout the Pale of Settlement and cities where Jews lived. Many begin to leave as well. Uh, 
and sort of complementing the exodus of Jews beginning in the 1880s, Jews were leaving more for economic reasons uh, because of the dead end life they had and the anti-Semitism they had to face. Uh, but, you know, the pogroms do serve to push Jews to consider leaving the Russian Empire. And they were able to do so, and a lot go to Palestine, and others go, you know, to the United States, North America, as well. Yeah, was was Odessa uh, an outlier in its diversity, or or are there other parts of Ukraine that were similarly mixed? It's an outlier. Outlier. It's an outlier to have a city that's, if you count Russians, Ukrainians, and other Slavic peoples, to be sixty percent of the population of a city or a town, that is low. Uh, if you look at Petersburg and Moscow, it's 85 to 93% of people who are Orthodox Christians, mm -hmm. uh, meaning that they're Russian or Ukrainian. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to have a, a major city that's 35, 40% Jewish is just unheard of. Plus, there is, because of the its role in the world economy, it's attracting people from all over the world. St. Mm -hmm. Petersburg has lots of foreigners because of its trade and because a lot of embassies and consulates are located there, uh, but it doesn't attract this kind of, you know, it doesn't attract the people who are in, got involved in business and trade as much as Odessa does. So it, you know, I think, you know, to give you an idea about Odessa, the first newspaper was in French in the 1820s. Mm -hmm. Street signs are in French. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the foreign influence has always played an important role mm -hmm. in Odessa, and you, and it becomes, you know, it, it remains, but it becomes much more Jewish and much more Russian over the course of the 19th century. As I saw in one little history that it was the first city in the entire empire to have trams have a tram system yes yes it was a modern city yeah um, you know like all cities who begin to modernize with electric electric lights trams you know sewer systems that actually work they uh, have this so, fabulous so, concert hall this beautiful yeah. round building yeah but you know they have a theater they have opera they have everything that you would associate with a cultural metropolis it's known as a very cosmopolitan city uh and it's a cosmopolitan center for Jews, Russians, even Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. uh, but along with that, that doesn't, doesn't mean everybody is cosmopolitan in the city. Yeah. Uh, I've been really interested, you know, even before this war um, between Ukraine and Russia, in, in the sort of rural-urban divide that existed through much of Ukraine's history. Uh, you you had alluded to this earlier, you know, a lot of Ukrainians lived in villages, they worked on farms. Uh, it wasn't um, early on an urban population. Of course, that, that began to change. And I saw by the 1940s, they were the dominant ethnic group in, mm -hmm. in Odessa. But can you talk about that the divide historically in Ukraine and how, and, and how it how it plays into this war going on now, in which Russia claims Ukraine as a Russian place. That's interesting. I'm not sure I can do justice to it. Uh, I mean, I do think there's always been a divide between in the Russian Russian history, certainly at the beginning of the 19th century and continuing to the 20th, between uh, the vast interior, the hinterland, as it's called, that is agrarian and rural. Uh, and the pockets of modernity that are in the cities. So, I mean, to give you an example. It tended to have bigger Russian populations. But yeah. The Russians would be in the, in the yeah. Ukrainian cities. Yeah. But to give you an idea of you know, sort of this rural-urban nexus, beginning in the 1930s, for example, and I'm talking about the Soviet Union in general, mm -hmm. Once people begin to leave the countryside for work in factories that are going that are cropping up and because of the five year plans and rapid industrialization, trying to escape famine in, in the countryside, these people come and they 
actually, in a sense, ruralized these cities. Now, within a generation or two, these people will become more urban, or their children will be. But if you invite, if you have several million peasants moving to a city with no previous exposure to urban life, they bring their traditions, their habits with them. I just said this in class the other day, you know, most peasant families want, you know, you have chickens, so you have eggs, right? What happens when you move to a city and you're in an apartment building? Where do you keep the chickens? Right? On the terrace. Them, not in the courtyard, <laughs> you put them into the apartment. So, I mean, that's not modern urban life. Uh, that's going to change, but uh, these people have never seen a tram. They don't know what a sidewalk is. They certainly don't know what a street light is or a, you know, a traffic light. So they have to get adjusted as well. And I imagine this, you know, that's all changed by the time we get into the mid to 20th century. Uh, but, you know, historically, there's a big divide between, you know, urban, educated, for the most part, Russia, U Odessa, Ukraine, and everybody else. And people, and that sort of provides the underbelly to these, this, what I call a veneer of, high culture and modernity that exists in many of these cities. Uh, it won't take you long to find pockets of poverty, especially in Odessa, where there isn't any ghettoization or legal ghetto. Jews can live anywhere. And you know, there are areas that are more working class that Russians tend to, or Ukrainians tend to, or Jews tend to. But even in the nice parts of the city center, there are going to be lots of poor people living there too so everybody is rubbing shoulders mm -hmm. uh, but how does the influx of um ukrainian peasants let's call them um affect the language i i i read that um the russians spoken in odessa is its own special dialect yeah there's always a special russian and people can tell this person's from odessa same with uh whether you're jewish or russian uh the idioms and the accent and the, and, the, and the words you use and so on. But to give you an idea how complicated Odessa is and how the identity of Odessa is getting to back to what you started with about is Ukraine, you know, what is Ukraine in terms of its identity, Ukrainian, Russian, it's mixed. Uh, not only are there are a lot of intermarriages between Russians and Ukrainians, but I was just looking this up. So Odessa is about 70% of this population would say that identify as ethnically Ukrainian. Today. Yeah, today. 25% mm -hmm. say we're ethnic Russians. Mm. Okay. 96% uh, of all these families speak some Russian mm -hmm. at home. And about 30% speak some Ukrainian home. So that means even if they strongly identify as Ukrainian, they're still speaking Russian. Mm -hmm. And I've been there and like, you know, you can, you don't need you to know Ukrainian. Yeah. Well, I, always, I think it's fascinating that Zelensky uh, was a Russian speaker. Yeah. Uh, and has only recently, because of this war, switched. Um, do, you, do you think we're going to see more... Um, Ukrainian's Ukrainization. I think so. Of, I mean, I of think language and and some cultural traditions. Yeah, I mean, it depends how the war ends, but mm -hmm. I imagine if Ukraine is able to win the war, uh, people who are ethnically Russian may feel, or maybe encouraged to leave. I don't know if they're going to be forced out, but so many families are mixes, and they don't think in these terms. Uh, you know, they may say, oh, well, I'm Russian, I'm Ukrainian. Uh, but I do think there's efforts to write in under Soviet power. You had to learn Russian, mm -hmm. you attend mm -hmm. a school in Ukrainian, but you also had to learn Russian. And Zelensky obviously grew up and never bothered to learn Ukrainian. Uh, the languages are similar, but they're not identical. Mm -hmm. And I know I got lost in the subways in Kiev because everything's in Ukrainian and mm -hmm. 
I said, oh, I just don't know what this word means. And, and they're using the Latin al alphabet or, or the Cyrillic? Yeah, Cyrillic, Cyrillic. Um, so, you know, you have to know Cyrillic, but then it's not Russian. It looks like Russian, but it's not Russian. And the vocabulary is different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to say Ukraine is Russian, Ukrainian, certainly not Jewish anymore because the mm -hmm. Jews were killed during World War II. Uh, and those who returned after the war have emigrated for the most part, or they moved elsewhere in, uh, in the empire. But it's a complicated uh, identity. And I think you'd be hard pressed to say it's Ukrainian or Russian. Uh, historically, it's been more Russian, as we've discussed. But there's also a strong, since the 1930s, a strong Ukrainian presence in the city. Uh, but Ukrainians are still not, you know, they're the majority of the people, but not 90%. You still have a lot of Russians living there. And, uh, you know, I was just talking to a friend who's grew up in Kiev, moved to Israel, now lives in Philadelphia, Jewish, and speaks perfect Russian, knows Ukrainian, but never really spoke it that much. And she said when the war began, she uh, began to think of herself as Ukrainian before she was Jewish or Russian. She never thought in, that there was Ukrainian mm -hmm. as part of identity, but now she has this civic identity and try as much Putin wants. He can't tell people how to identify. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. you know, if they mm -hmm. want to identify as Ukrainian, they're going to identify as Ukrainian mm -hmm. and not yeah, Russian. Yeah, I'm sure this, this war has definitely accelerated that. It's backfired in that regard. I mean, yeah, we just didn't understand. He just he's just interested in restoring the empire and mm -hmm. he comes up with the explanations that historians have told him. Yeah, I, I want to touch on one other group, um, and that's the Cossacks. And I, and I think it's just worth pointing out to people who may not know this, but um, the very name Ukraine or Ukraina. Uh, literally means borderland, and and the people we call Cossacks were essentially the border police or the you know border army. Is there a difference culturally and ethnically between Ukrainians and Cossacks? That's a good question. I just wanted to step back a bit. You know, sort of when you talk about Ukrainian identity, the origins of it, it's identified or it's seen as part and parcel part of Cossacks. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that see themselves as in identity as Ukrainians, mm -hmm. uh, and they are self self regulating autonomous communities for seventeenth, eighteenth, nineteenth centuries. And I don't know how much intermarriage there is between you know a Ukrainian peasant and a Cossack uh, person, and that you know I could try to find out more about that. Uh, but, you know, Ukrainian identity is slow to develop. It's not until, you know, a national identity as of Ukraine, it's not until the 19th century that people begin, intellectuals begin to think in those terms. So there then this identity that begins with Cossacks in the 17th and 18th century grows into this identity, a national identity of Ukraine. And Cossacks can be part of that. They can also be part of the Russian identity as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know much about the Cossacks uh, mm -hmm. in terms of what the language they speak. But I imagine Cossacks in Ukraine can speak Ukrainian if they mm -hmm. need to. Yeah, that's a, that's a bit later than other Slavic groups um, in Eastern Europe, because, um, mm -hmm. you know, after, I would say, 1848, the second half of the 19th century, like Serbs and Bulgarians and Czechs and Slovaks and Macedonians, Montenegrins mm. all all start to have individual identities and start to fight with each other over yeah yeah over that. But, but the Ukrainians develop theirs later. You think? Yeah, it's later, and it may be that there isn't any Ukrainian state, mm -hmm. right? There, you know, the center of North Russian Ukrainian culture uh, begins in Kiev. In the ninth century, uh, and those now we will spread throughout the region. Moscow eventually supplants Kiev, 
and becomes the center of Orthodox uh, Slavdom. And, but Ukraine will find itself part of the, what is known as the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth that exists until the late 18th century. And so their orientation is to the West, mm -hmm. to Poland, Catholicism, Ukrainians living in the East, they become part of the Russian influence, mm -hmm. Europe mm -hmm. influence. And mm -hmm. so they're really torn between two different poles. And I think Ukrainian nationalism is, 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 doesn't get started until uh, the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth collapses and Ukrainians have to decide where to be, who they want to be. Uh, and because of because of national sort of nation building taking off in Europe in the or, uh, in the early part of the nineteenth century, Ukrainian intellectuals begin to think of themselves, right? They have their own different language, uh, and they begin to see that as the center of a Ukrainian nation. And all nations have to have their own territory. Mm -hmm. so you get, you know, a nation state. But was there any great Ukrainian writer that sort of gave the way a lot of um, nation states? Yeah, Shevchenko. Uh -huh. Shevchenko. Uh, and there's another person whose name just slips my head right uh -huh. now. Mm -hmm. But they're well famous in the 19th century. And then the Russian government in the second or the third last quarter of the, the 18th, 19th century begin to crack down on this growth of Ukrainian culture and literary uh, output and forbids the publication of anything in Ukrainian. Uh-huh, that's interesting. Right? Yeah, so it becomes harder to promote it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, after the Russian Revolution in 1980, you know, Ukraine, there's a strong independence movement and they create an independent Ukrainian state in the aftermath of 1917. And it's only it takes Russia a few years to actually defeat that force and reintegrate Ukraine. But there, Putin's not correct to say there wasn't any independent Ukraine until the Bolsheviks grant Ukraine independence in 1922. Ukrainians themselves created an independent state. Uh, it only lasted four years. But uh, it's not accurate to say that any sense of national independence or sovereignty is a gift, as he likes to call it, Putin, that is, to the Ukrainian people. It's, you know, a big mistake by mm -hmm. the uh, communist regime to do that. Yeah. The Ukrainians have uh, some good grievances against the, the Soviets and the Russians. Yeah. You know, the yeah. famine. Um, yeah. um, they the mother no, they certainly, the intellectual cultural elite of the 1930s are purged. Uh, Ukraine is, you know, on the other hand, Soviet nationality policy guaranteed all national minorities a sense of cultural autonomy, so long as it's socialist and communist, they follow the guidelines set by the Kremlin. But, uh, you know, there is a awareness that you are Ukrainian or you are Jewish or Armenian because it's on your internal mm -hmm. path. Mm -hmm. right? So it's, you get designated in mm -hmm. your nationality. And so it's not a surprise that people stop thinking about it because they, you know, why am I Ukrainian? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even a territory that's demarcated as Ukraine historically, but it also gives people a sense that they are so for having that kind of a designation means that we must be different from other people in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. and it right. never dies. I mean, that's why the Soviet Union just falls apart beginning in the late 80s, because mm -hmm. all these national minorities want independence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we've talked a bit about um, Odessa and the Ukrainian imagination. How does it figure in the Russian imagination? I know it was like one of the great like summer vacation spots along with the Crimea. Yeah. Um, and Russians well, love beaches. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, they see it sort of as a Russian city, given mm-hmm. the fact that Russians had always lived there and were the dominant group of people, and that there's a vibrant Russian cultural and literary uh, world that is centered in Odessa. So it's hard for them to think of the city as not Russian. Mm-hmm. And now that you now, if there were no Jews living there, then the Jewish aspect of Odessa's identity is gone, you know, and Ukrainian identity is is much smaller and submerged. Uh, Ukrainian cultural and national awakenings, it's stronger in Kiev and Kharkiv than it is in Odessa, Mm -hmm. uh, which is a newer city and doesn't attract as many Ukrainians. So, you know, I think it was last year sometime they the Odessa municipal government took down the statue of Catherine the Great mm. it's been there for a long time uh because they feel that Russia's colonized mm-hmm. Odessa. and that doesn't sit well with uh Putin because no, I can't imagine. The, Russian, the Russian uh heritage of the city and it certainly is right uh you know what's growing is this it could be a you know, a Ukrainian identity that is bilingual, if you will, uh, right? There's, you can be Ukrainian and probably still speak Russian, and mm-hmm. no one will mm-hmm. think twice about it. Mm-hmm. It can be seen as a more of a civic identity rather than an ec- ethnic identity. So, Have you, Has the Ukrainian government, either before the war started or since the war started, um, taken any legal action to ban any aspects of Russian culture, like Russian in official documents or in I'm not aware. I don't know. I'm, I just, I'm, I haven't read anything about that, although I haven't really been following what's going on in Odessa since 1991, uh, right? But I, from what I can tell, certainly children are going to school learning Ukrainian, but they're also learning Russian and they're also learning to speak Russian at home with their mm-hmm. families. So, but they don't, they never banned Russian as a language. I mean, it's really a bilingual city. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I don't think, unlike, I think, unlike some of the Baltic countries that were forcing Russians to learn Latvian if they wanted to become citizens, mm-hmm. I don't think that happened in Ukraine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I covered the war in Yugoslavia when Yugoslavia broke up and, and a lot of the grievance, grievances originated with what was taught in the schools. Mm-hmm. You know, sure. Whose history was emphasized, whose language was emphasized. Yeah. You know, were, were the official government documents um, in multiple languages. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's really, that's really hard because everyone, you know, people from different groups have entirely different views of. Yeah. It's a political tool, and uh, it's a political tool in all countries, as we know. Uh, How are you going to talk about your country's past? Yeah, including our own. Yeah, what's happening in the United States. I mean, you obviously want to downplay the negative side of the country's history and uh, play up the positive aspects of it, but also ignore those aspects of the country's history that are inconvenient. Like mm-hmm. you can't, I mean, it would be difficult to talk about Odessa without talking about the Jewish influence or even the Russian influence. Maybe not so much since 1945, but if you're talking about his, Odessa's history from the beginning uh, to the 1920s, 1930s, you can't ignore the presence of all these other people, as well as the Greeks. Mm-hmm. And Armenians and Turks and French and Italians and Romanians. Yeah, they're it's all there. Close to Romania. Yeah, and Romanians too. It's just mm-hmm. across the sea, and so there's a lot of influence. Uh, yeah. Oh, I forgot one thing that just occurred to me uh-huh. as a. Uh, I have, there's an association, this is why I thought of it. Pushkin was exiled. He lived in Odessa for a year or two in the 1820s. So that's another mm. weapon in Putin's arsenal to say, oh, this is really... You know, if if Pushkin lived in Odessa, then mm-hmm. clearly mm-hmm. Russian city, because mm-hmm. you don't get any 
better than Pushkin when it comes to Russian, the Russian language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so. Right, uh, right, right. Yeah, it is, it, you know, there's no doubt that there's, this, you know, historical and cultural overlap. Um, yeah, yeah. Since, since the war began, um, it's been increasingly seen as part of a larger global narrative, a, a battle between Western style democracy and, and autocracy. How democratic was Ukraine before the war? And, and how much do you think uh, the desire to be part of the Western, the club of Western nations is, is, is driving the Ukrainians in, in, this, in this war? Well, did you? Okay, so I think clearly Ukraine was looking to the West. Mm -hmm. They don't want to be part of the Russian orbit of influence, and so the the idea that Ukraine could join NATO or the EU just is too dangerous. Is the prospect is too frightening for someone like Putin? Who, you know, we can have NATO on our doorsteps. Uh, Right. And, it, you know, this is a Slavic country that's, you know, and always been part of the Russian Empire and we can't lose it to the to the West. And uh, but, you know, even within Ukraine, there were two different orientations after 2000. Some people are really oriented to the West. Others were more oriented to the to Russia. And then you have the Maidan. Uh, protests of a decade ago that sort of underscored this people where are you going to look for your uh support whether it's moscow or it's going to be western europe nato mm -hmm. or you think either. you think that was driven by um a desire to share in the prosperity of western nations or was it driven by a desire to have sort of open transparent that, that i can't answer definitively i do think it may have been there's more opportunity by looking west, mm -hmm. right? The Baltic countries, you know, when they become independent after 91, they're not thinking, oh, we should really tie ourselves to Russia, the, so the remnants mm -hmm. of the Soviet Union. We're going to look to Finland or Germany. They had a lot of grievances too. Yeah, and they have, right? So, uh, but they're, and I, the, the leaders, uh, and I can't remember his name, who gets deposed in 2014, if I'm not mistaken, after May Maidan. For reasons he go, he looks to Russia because uh, they promised him a lot, probably, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of personal power and economic support. And I don't know enough about his personal ideas to know why he favored Russia rather than continuing looking to the West. But uh, I think it's a combination that, you know, if, under who do I want to take orders from, Putin or the EU? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. They, no contest. For us, it's not a question, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Although they, Russia was prospering. Yeah, but it's still you have to deal and with making a lot of progress economically. Yeah, but you still have to deal with Russia. That's making it clear that we want to dominate you. Mm -hmm. uh, and the EU is not going to impose itself in the same way mm -hmm. as Russia will, uh, right? And, you know, Russia's just going to encourage corruption. So mm -hmm. the, the prime minister who's deposed, you know, is, is his hands in the till constantly. Mm -hmm. So I mean, Ukraine had all these resources that the oligarchs just took and the leadership took. So it was very corrupt society and it may still be and i imagine it still is but the war is sort of unifying the country i presume mm -hmm. around the threat of russia mm -hmm. right the war has been at a kind of stalemate now for yeah. several months and and it seems like it's getting harder for the biden administration and for european leaders to maintain um a high level of of military military support for Ukraine. We're seeing that in, in the, the vote in Congress and, um, you know, attentions being diverted to, to Israel and Gaza. Um, I know you're, you're not a foreign party. No, it's okay. But you know, um, how, how do you think it's going to go? What, I mean, how do you see it playing out? Well, you know, I think Ukraine probably needs more advanced weaponry. 
and NATO or the, you know, or countries on their own. And the United States will have to decide what can we give Ukraine to help fend off the Russians. Uh, on the other hand, there seems to be a decreasing desire to keep pumping money into Ukraine by many in Congress. Uh, and now with the war in Gaza, the, you know, there's more money that has to be spent if they're going to live up to its commitments. And, you know, if the war spreads throughout the Middle East, then, if, you know, that's going to divert attention away from Ukraine. But the U Russian army has just been shown to be useless <laughs> uh, since the Although war. Although they are regrouping a bit. And they're regrouping a bit, but, you know, they're still as... You know, they held on to their territory that they seized, but they couldn't do any more. And they certainly are good at bombing. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. seen that in Ukraine. We've seen it in Syria. They're very good at waging war from the air, but they're not able to actually win the war that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been struck by how old fashioned the tactics have been. It's like um, it's like they're still fighting World War II. Like the yeah. way they rolled tanks in in the beginning, yeah, like yeah, columns was... of tanks. I mean, didn't they know <laughs> that all these tanks that sort of run out of gas? You know, <laughs> you know right. twenty and miles just... of them, and they're not going anywhere. They just sat there. Mm -hmm. uh, had Ukraine been armed well, they would have destroyed all the tanks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and that's partly because. The military was corrupt. So the resources mm -hmm. that should have gone into modernizing the forces went into people's pockets. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, they, they delivered 10 of the tanks they were supposed to and not 50 of them. Because mm -hmm. uh, that's how the Russian economy works. And yeah, they were shown to be, at least the infantry and the ground forces, to be, you know, a laughing matter. You know, yeah. it uh, so I just want to ask you one other thing, and then we'll sure. we'll open it to questions. Um, so we we're in this kind of stalemate where the Russians um, have the this sort of um, um, kind of eastern uh, south of land um, known as the Donbas, which is mm -hmm. uh, heavily industrial, and it was where a lot of wealth was. Uh, if that ends up being the the new border. <laughs> the new Ukraina, uh, uh, what are the economic prospects for Odessa mm -hmm. and, and Ukraine? Oh, if it's right. this shrunken uh, place, I mean, they still have a lot of wheat in the West, I understand. Yeah, but, you know, they're going to lose an industrial center and uh, resources, coal and so on, and the industrial infrastructure that's there. So it will hurt the economy of Ukraine. Uh, and, uh, you know, so it's hard to predict exactly what the economic consequences will be. But, uh, you know, it may be also that the infrastructure is so destroyed after the war that it may be hard for Russia to rebuild it. Although I think they can if they wanted to devote the resources to it, they could certainly modernize it. And that just brings up one little point. These areas of... Uh, Donetsk, Lugansk, or Luhansk, uh, they weren't really Russian until some British industrialists set up factories and mines there in the late 19th century. <laughs> so to claim that they histor they're historically Russian is mm -hmm. just another figment of mm -hmm. Putin's mm -hmm. history book. Right, that's interesting. And then the Soviets must have um, continued that industrial expansion. Yeah, yeah, and so Russians moved there. That's why there are a lot of Russians there, mm -hmm. and they intermarried, and so they look to Russia because mm -hmm. that's its that's its neighbor. Whereas mm -hmm. in eastern Ukraine looks mm -hmm. to the west for its natural neighbor. Uh, very different orientations. Yeah, uh, you know, the so Soviet power, communism certainly homogenized what's going on, what went on in Ukraine with influx of Russians and other national minorities into Ukraine. But this divide still, you know, existed and still exists of where people are looking for its uh, support, mm -hmm. either towards Russia or to the mm -hmm. West. Mm 
Mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. That's a problem for Putin. Do you think the people who, the Russian, ethnic Russians in that part of Ukraine really feel a great loyalty to Russia, or is it just that they can't do anything about it? I don't it? know. It's, it's I, I just don't know what they really believe. Mm -hmm. uh, many do. Obviously, mm -hmm. they wouldn't have started this unofficial war with Russian support. But whether every, I mean, right now, probably everybody, you know, and they may not, there may be many people who, you know, buy accept everything that the Russian media is telling them about, you know, this is a fight against Nazis and a fight against Ukrainian uh, aggression, but others may not. And you're just not going to hear those voices. Uh, right? They're caught in a, in a, in a war. Mm -hmm. And they're just sitting, you know, they have no control over what's going to happen to their lives. Right. So There's a long tradition of, of sort of passivity in, in Russian political yeah. life because of its history. Yeah. It's just never been a well-developed civic society. Yeah. Uh, and there's no real, you know, debate there's no, in, the, in the parliament or, no. or media. Yeah. Um, uh, so whatever, civic just, you know, whatever civil society politically minded emerged in the 90s and after 2000, that's all been destroyed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you... Unless you want to be arrested, you keep your mouth closed. Right, um, right, right, and, right. Uh, you know that's you know so you don't people don't know. We we do have a couple of questions here okay. in the chat. Yeah. Um, so um, one from Ryan Snyder who asks, um, "How did Odessa's status as a free port influence its identity? Uh, does this historic status con continue to shape the city today?" Well, it certainly affected its identity in terms of being very polyglot. You know, it's a home where you could hear all sorts of languages in the streets. It attracts people from all over the Europe. Uh, so it gives its sort of a cosmopolitan uh, flair that sort of is cut off you know, beginning in the 1920s as the Soviet Union retrenches and sort of prevents this natural interchange or exchange of ideas and culture between Europe and Odessa. But nonetheless, it's still a port. So uh, there are sailors coming in and out and bringing all sorts of goods that they can sell in the black market and uh, or give away. So uh, it's a much diminished global or cosmopolitan uh, city after you know the mid 1920s, but compared to many other cities, uh, it's it's it has a different flavor to it, and the architecture is different. It sort of looks like Europe in many in the nice parts of the city uh, with its architecture and so on, and the history so. It has a different flavor from many other cities, uh, most other cities in in the Soviet Union. But mm -hmm. you know, cutting off, you know, by closing the borders, it prevents this exchange of different cultures and ideas and ways of life and thinking mm -hmm. that existed prior to 1914. We have a question from uh, John Valencia, who asks, what was the environment in Odessa like during the period of famine called the Holodomor? Mm -hmm. uh, due to its existence as a port city, which grain flowed through, was it able to largely avoid the food shortage? That's interesting. Well, it and may have avoided the food shortages more than someone living on a collective farm in the interior, but there were food shortages everywhere in and even in odessa uh they might have you know there might have been a lot of corruption over the grain that was being imported exported in the 1930s to pay for the import of technology but you know they certainly had it better than peasants on collective farms uh but surely the you know, the effects of the famine certainly reached 
uh, Odessa, whether people were starving as they did in the collective farm in the villages, I don't know. I don't think so. But they had to see the Soviet government tried to uh, supply cities with the basic needs, uh, necessities of life, because they had industries there and other institutions that had to be supported. And uh, so I imagine Odessa didn't feel the brunt of it as much as the interior of Ukraine. And then um, another question, um, do you see any viable resistance forming in Russia against the war? Uh, not right now. I'm one, right? I mean, you, you, if you think about the strong resistance that exists under, you know, Navalny, I mean, you mm -hmm. see what happens to him. So I think uh, the resistance is n not going to happen yet because uh, people are just going to be arrested mm -hmm. and imprisoned. Or, or, or killed. Like, yeah. um... And, you know, people, you know, people voting with their feet. If they do, mm -hmm. that, lots of people just can't be there anymore. And they're mm -hmm. going to other countries uh, where they don't have to be part of what Russia's doing. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the middle class, the educated. Yeah. How serious do you think that brain drain will be in terms of Russia's economic future? I think it's pretty serious. People mm -hmm. may return to Russia, but it's probably pretty serious. But on the other hand, there are still plenty of people who are quite competent, obviously, to to do all that technological work. I mean, you know, the computer work that needs to be done. So it's hard to say. I don't know, you know, the numbers of how many people have left. But, you know, now, you know, when I'm in, you know, if I, I'm in touch with an organization, that just these are Russians living in Armenia, Georgia, uh, Turkey, uh, Poland, uh, doing all the work that they would normally do, or the Baltics, mm -hmm. right? There, there was an, sort of an alternative news, political newspaper, Medusa, and it's now headquartered in Latvia. Mm -hmm. They picked up and left, so they wouldn't get arrested. <laughs> Mm -hmm. It's clear. Uh, so mm -hmm. they just left. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Know, so that's where, you know, the base of the opposition is going to be located. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, I can't think of the word, uh, you know, the, like the French government under de Gaulle in World War II. Oh, Wars. right. The resistance. Uh, the... Resistance government yeah. in absence. In ab yeah. In absence. yeah. So that's where a lot of the resistance goes. Or, you know, I knew plenty of several people just moved to Israel, you know. Yeah. Do you see any way, um, and this will be, I guess, my, my last question, do you see an, any way that, uh, of exiting Putin from the stage? Or, yeah. I mean, he's so insulated, I imagine. <laughs> like, he's... you couldn't even get close enough to him to assassinate yeah. him. I thought maybe two years ago, I thought maybe they'll just, you know, the oligarchs will just say, this is too much, mm -hmm. right? He's destroying our money. It's hurting the country. Mm -hmm. But that just hasn't happened. Yeah. And, and look what clearly, happened to Pogosian. You know, he clearly is well protected. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one could only hope, uh, you know, he has a heart attack. Or right. someone does decide that we're going to stage. Uh, uh Prigozhin, that right mm -hmm. that's his name and that was just so bizarre mm -hmm. mm -hmm. thinking he was going to maybe depose putin by mm -hmm. marching on moscow uh mm -hmm. surprised me it took them that long to put it down and to kill yeah. the guy but yeah yeah uh, you know so he may have you know it's not clear we don't know who's really you know how much control does he have but so long as the military or his close guards stay loyal mm -hmm. right rumors have it you know he's got all these doubles and nobody knows mm -hmm. where he is and when he mm -hmm. leaves, mm -hmm. and which, which limousine to follow mm -hmm. uh, so he's you know keeps a low profile mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and of yeah. course what follows him if if he were somehow deposed what follows him could be worse could be but there's no you know i would just assume the system's going to implode because mm -hmm. he's the one that's holding it together. Mm -hmm. Right? There's going to be, 
all these people are just they're just interested in money mm. <laughs> if mm-hmm. there's more money to be had they're going to fight each other right right, it's right not clear if there's anybody that could restore a sense of order to the mm-hmm. way to mm-hmm. the political system i i'm, I'm not an I'm far from an expert, and I certainly don't follow this. I just don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it'd be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Bob. Mm. It's been great talking to you. And, and thank you, everybody, for, for listening and participating. And um, there's a whole program of, of discussions about cities. It is interesting to, to think about um, their similarities, like the similarities between Trieste and Odessa and mm-hmm. other other cities on the edge of empires. Yeah, port um, cities are special, mm-hmm, they, right? You know, they share a lot of common characteristics mm-hmm. at where they're located, mm-hmm. and a lot of it has to do that they're sort of connected to the rest of the world much more easily than a city in the interior of a country. Mm-hmm. Just the nature of port cities, it's, right? It sort of co- encourages this kind of contact but anyway i want to thank you for these great questions and the audience too the people who asked the questions they were provocative thank yeah. you yeah uh, really appreciated it and yeah. uh, thank you and yeah. i know we'll meet you in person uh, <laughs> yes yeah, see you soon thank you bob yeah. thank you everyone and thank you and thank you paul and kevin for all you've done for yes this. Yeah. well there yeah. you are you're back anyway yeah, thank thank i just you. wanted yeah. to jump on and Thank you both for joining us tonight. A really uh, terrific conversation, just uh, hearing about all the various dimensions of Ukraine and Odessa was uh, filled in a lot of uh, gaps for me. That's good. I'm glad. And the story will continue. I mean, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, it's really unfortunate because Odessa, I mean, so long as, you know, Odessa gets bombed or destroyed more, I mean, it's going to be a tragedy. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you know, Russia also doesn't want to destroy Odessa because they may need Odessa as a port <laughs> if mm-hmm. they win war. Yeah. You know, in the long term. So, how much of the infrastructure do you want to destroy? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, thank you both for your insights, and uh, thank you. Thank we you. We will uh, look for your latest books coming out, both of you. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks, thanks Paul. Pleasure. I have to finish all about. I have to finish reading about caviar. (laughs) Uh, So I stopped eating caviar when I realized the sturgeons were gone, and I don't trust American caviar to be as good. So I don't know. But uh, farmed caviar. Yeah. Well, you know, not that I have opportunities to eat caviar in the United States because it's so expensive. But uh, like you, it was amazing to have all this caviar. We tend to eat a lot of the red caviar, mm-hmm. always mm-hmm. cheaper and available. But having the real caviar was just such a treat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, was, there was so it, much it was of it. Free, yeah. <laughs> it's free. It's great. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. And my wife was always in the '80s when she was there. People would invite her over to their homes because they wanted they had this, they wanted their sons to mar- marry marry so they could get out of the country and she'd go in there and they always had all this black caviar and she would take some and said oh no no Lori, this is how you put on caviar and they just you know dump it on so she would eat more caviar as a way to butter up and uh get her to agree to marry their son to get out of the country so uh Caviar is is a diplomatic tool as well. That's for sure. Anyway. Thank you both, and thank you, the uh, audience, for joining us. And I hope to see all of you uh, uh, in the near future with those two events coming up, including more on cities and historical perspective. All right. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bob.